Good evening. I'm Dr. Jared Weiss, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Medical Oncologist at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Vice President of Cancer Grace. It is my great pleasure this evening to welcome you to our uh, podcast on chemotherapy and radiotherapy for late-stage oropharynx cancer. Dr. Jeffrey Geiger is an Assistant Professor and Attending Physician in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Pennsylvania Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. I've had the great pleasure of knowing Dr. Geiger since we were both in training, where I observed a clinician who is incredibly compassionate, both in the room with his patients and when making meticulous radiation plans for them. It's a privilege to call him a friend and a colleague, and it is a privilege to introduce him this evening. He will start our presentation by discussing radiation therapy for late-stage oropharynx cancer, and then I will give uh, a briefer presentation on chemotherapy used in these paradigms. Dr. Geiger? Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for that lovely introduction. So we're going to be talking about chemotherapy and radiotherapy for late-stage oropharynx cancer. And this subject is something that we could wax on about for many, many hours and get into incredible detail about. But we will only be scratching the surface tonight, talking about the basics of radiotherapy, and then more importantly, kind of uh, investigating what it would be like to be a patient and what the steps are involved in order to move forward with the process if you are finding yourself in the position of requiring uh, such therapy for uh, oropharynx cancer. So I think one of the most important things to address up front is that it's really a very multidisciplinary team that we need in order to effectively treat head and neck cancer patients. And that involves a lot of persons. It involves the surgeons frequently, uh, the medical oncologists like Dr. Weiss, the radiation oncologists such as myself. It can involve plastic surgeons, uh, need dental and oral surgical evaluation prior to treatment. We also have to pay particular attention to their diet. Um, if Mouth opening is an issue after surgery. Speech pathology can be very important. And then, of course, social work and family support is critically important. Now, unfortunately, people can develop cancer in many different areas of the head and neck, and it's incredibly anatomically complicated. I'm just going to briefly run through some of the subsites, but cancers of the mouth, which are typically things of the lips and gums, palate are very different from the cancers that we're going to be talking about today that affect predominantly the tonsils, uh, the soft palate as opposed to the, the bony hard palate in front of it, and really the base of tongue. So really we think about these cancers as typically being tonsillar or base of tongue cancers. Very different from larynx cancers, you know, voice box type cancers um, that are actually on the decline, fortunately. And there are a number of other subsites that we uh, need not wax on about, but um, lower down the hypopharynx, upper part of your head and the nasal cavity and around your nose and the paranasal sinuses. And then, of course, there are glands that produce saliva that we'll be talking about today a little bit that can develop tumors in them. And, of course, thyroid cancer is a totally separate entity. I think that the most important thing to, to briefly touch on is the human papillomavirus, and to discuss how important this virus is now in the development of many head and neck cancers. So I treat both gynecological and head and neck cancers, and so encounter many, many cases where HPV is the predominant factor in the causation of the tumor. This is a family of viruses that has a particular liking for linings of various organs, such as the mouth and throat, and you know, gynecological linings. And there are hundreds of types of HPV infection. Now, fortunately, there are only a few different subtypes that cause people will confer a higher risk of cancer. Uh, the numbers are listed there, 16, 18, 31, 33, and 35 whereas lower risk subtypes such as 6 or 11 uh, don't confer, confer the same risk of uh, cancer causation as the higher risk subtypes. And in fact, HPV-16 in particular 
is the one that accounts for 90 to 95 percent of head and neck cancers. And it has a particular predominance in cancers of the oropharynx as opposed to other subsites. Um, HPV DNA, so if we look at the lining of the skin or throat or cervix, um, the, we can detect whether or not there's DNA of the HPV virus located there. And it's located in about 26% of head and neck cancers, but much more frequently in oropharynx cancers, more than 50%. So when we talk about tonsils, there are tonsils that are both at the base of your tongue and what we typically think of as the tonsils where you know, children have them removed from your mouth that are higher up and are actually paired um, and can be seen with a basic uh, oral examination. Now, HPV-induced cancers tend to affect younger patients, and unlike head and neck cancers before, where it was predominantly smokers and drinkers that were being affected, uh, we see younger patients now, much younger patients, patients in their 30s and 40s, and the HPV infection predominance in, in oropharynx cancers is really uh, male more than female. And HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. And so high risk sexual behaviors correlate with infection. And obviously there's a number of risk factors that you can see on the slide that do increase your risk of HPV infection. And if you're unfortunate enough to get HPV-16 uh, infection, then your risk of cancer does rise both in the region of the cervix and in the head and neck region, in particular the uh, oropharynx region. So other risk factors include anything that's going to suppress your immune system, such as HIV, organ transplantation, and the drugs that you must take following organ transplantation, and not surprisingly, a prior history of cervical cancer um, in either yourself or in your spouse. So SEER, S-E-E-R, is a large database of uh, numbers and person data that has to do with Medicare patients. And although, you know, sort of in the 1973 to 2001 period, the incidence of most head and neck cancers declined, the incidence of tonsillar cancers and base of tongue cancers that are part of the oropharynx increased on the order of 2 to 4 percent per year. And that does mirror the HPV increase over that same period of time. So there's an important, very important clinical significance, clinical significance here. HPV positive tumors have a greatly improved prognosis compared to typical or older cancers that are affected or affect uh, smokers and drinkers. There's a basically a 60 to 80 percent reduction in the likelihood of death from cancer in these patients. And although they tend to affect younger patients, can actually present with much larger lymph node involvement, uh, they do better. And the, the thought processes here are that there is improved sensitivity to radiation and chemotherapy, um, and then the absence of things like smoking and drinking that affect the lining of the mouth and throat, and potentially some immune system uh, contributions that increase the efficacy of treatment and decrease your likelihood of uh, long-term sequelae from HPV-positive-induced cancers. So this is a picture of a large uh, oropharyngeal cancer uh, on the right side of this patient. And the therapeutic implications are that we can or are increasingly selecting patients for organ preservation therapy that have HPV-positive cancers, meaning essentially that we are more and more advocating for chemotherapy and radiation as opposed to surgery for these patients because they do so well. There is a prophylactic vaccine, perhaps you've heard of it, called Gardasil, that does prevent HPV infection in most patients and um, can uh, reduce the development of premalignant and invasive cervical cancer in patients. And animal data bears out similar results for reduction in likelihood of head and neck cancers, but um, we're going to see 
re require some time in order for us to see the long-term results of this um, vaccination and whether or not it really does work on both cervical and head and neck cancers, but there's no reason to think that it won't. Now that's separate from some therapeutic vaccines in development that could be used for patients that already have infection with HPV. But because our screening for HPV, particularly in the mouth and throat, is not really an equivalent pap smear or anything that we have uh, available to us for mouth uh, and throat cancers or uh, oral pharynx cancers in particular, we're a little bit behind in the head and neck department with respect to moving on with uh, prevention and uh, vaccination. So back to the Medicare analysis, this slide is busy, but if you look on the rightmost, the third set, you can see very clearly that there is a tremendous rise in oropharynx cancers overall, but particularly in men over the period of 2000 to 2010, and then this is the projected increase over the next 15 years or so, that this cancer before more and more men are vaccinated with Gardasil or there's some kind of therapeutic vaccine available to us that this cancer is going to be on the rise significantly and almost double during this, this time period. Uh, in women, it's much less common. In men, it's sort of driving this very rapid increase that you see in yellow. Over the same period of time, in the leftmost slide, you can see that other cancers of the head and neck are actually decreasing in incidence, and the thought process behind that is basically that there's less smoking and drinking, and the combination of these two factors really does increase your risk of developing head and neck cancer. And so in the absence of sites that are affected by human papillomavirus, we do expect that things like voice box cancers and other cancers of the mouth in particular, lips, gums, things that are affected by chewing tobacco and smoking, as that goes down, that those cancer uh, cases will go down as well. And we're, we're seeing that, and it's projected in this uh, paper that was published a couple years ago. So some factoids about which patients are most likely to have HPV-positive squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Obviously, we talked about non-smokers and non-drinkers. Um, and this is the case because HPV-positive cancers typically occur, again, in non-smokers and non-drinkers. So that presence of that particular set of co-carcinogens is not present in our HPV population by and large. And so we talked about the reasons why we think that that Im improves their outcome and their response to therapy. And ultimately, we're going to be looking at whether or not we can de-intensify or lower the amount of treatment we need to give the HPV positive population with respect to dose of chemotherapy and or radiation because these patients do much better unit for unit of treatment as compared to patients that have developed their cancers from heavy smoking and drinking. So definitive management of these cancers can involve surgery and has in the past. For early stage tumors, radiation alone. Definitive chemoradiotherapy, which is involved, or which involves rather the initiation of chemotherapy and radiation together for a period of about seven weeks traditionally. And occasionally, for various reasons, surgery is performed, and that's followed by adjuvant radiation, meaning after surgery or after surgery chemotherapy and radiation together, depending on the risk factors for that particular tumor. So the lining of the head and neck region, mouth, throat, uh, all of the salivary glands is very complicated. So patients with head and neck cancers in general develop spread to lymph nodes, which does not mean you're incurable. And in fact, you know, most of our patients have lymph node involvement in addition to the primary site. So let's say they have a tonsillar cancer more often than not, they have lymph node involvement. And on this screen, you can see that it's broken up into really seven regions. We typically see oropharynx cancers develop lymph nodes at level two, which you can see at level three uh, in the purple and pink wash there. And in HPV-positive cancers, there's actually a 
bit of a disproportionate amount of lymph node swelling and increase and spread as compared to the size of the primary tumor compared to tumors that are caused by smoking and drinking. So patients not infrequently present with very large lymph nodes involved in addition to their primary site of the tumor. So I'm only going to briefly touch on some data, but this is sort of some of the more recent data published uh, from Kin Ang that was a large radiation therapy oncology group study that um, started more than a decade ago and looked at 743 patients. And these patients were randomized to radiation therapy given with chemotherapy, cisplatin, which Dr. Weiss will be getting into, uh, three different administrations during radiotherapy. And then there were two different kinds of radiation that were given. One was a little bit of a modified regimen. And although ultimately it did not demonstrate that there was a big difference with respect to how the radiation was given, in the follow-up that was approximately five years on these patients, we did see that there was a tremendous benefit uh, in the HPV positive population with therapy as compared to the HPV negative population. So the data shows that the three-year overall survival in patients that are HPV positive was 82.4% versus 57.1% in the non-HPV population. So that was a huge, huge uh, important factoid that we elucidated from this study and definitely demonstrated the importance of HPV status. So this is the traditional chemotherapy regimen paradigm that we administer for patients that have what we call good performance status. You get radiation every day for seven weeks, Monday through Friday, and you get these three administrations of cisplatin during uh, the radiotherapy course. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Casts, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info, and that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.